All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first talk of the beginner track for the day. Thank you all for, for coming and to learn about policy as code and read, readable rego. Uh, quick show of hands. Who here is doing some sort of policy as code already in, in, their, in their stacks? All right, cool. And how many of you are already using Open Policy Agent? I mean, we got a couple. That's pretty good. All right. Well, uh, this is the beginner track, so this is going to be a very like introductory uh, uh, a talk on how to use Open Policy Agent, what it is, why it came about, and then we're just going to go over some quick examples of how to how to write uh, regal policies and how to clean up the code. So, uh, starting off, my name is Peter O'Neill. I am a senior DevOps engineer and evangelist uh, for a company called Webrite. We help do digital transformations and helping companies uh, move their legacy technologies to the cloud. Cool. So today's agenda, uh, talk a little bit about uh, why Open Policy Agent came about, the difference between Auth N and Auth Z, a bit about what it means for something to be policy as code, then we'll dive into the Open Policy Agent project, uh, and then we'll get into writing Rego and doing some unit testing. So let's get started. So, You've probably already seen something similar to this where, right, we've been moving to the cloud, we've taken these monoliths that we had, and we've break them down into these uh, microservices, right, and like breaking them into their smallest components. And so when this happens, right, there are a, a lot of points now that you have to make decisions, right? Now that we have all these different services, all of these services have API endpoints, all of, and then you have more users using these services, and all these services have more components. So now you can see the complexity here of all of these points. Now you have thousands of interactions that need some sort of authorization check when they happen, right? And so this is now why we move into the space, why we need a more fine-grained uh, access control system or authorization tool. And so. The reasons that a coarse-grained system, right, we're talking very simple like RBAC policies or just users, uh, where you can just have one simple rule around what a user can or can't do won't work, uh, right? It kind of lacks a lot of the complexities that our cloud-native systems need, right? And so when we talk about this, right, like these, these policies end up being uh, right, like hard-coded directly into the application, they end up being very error-prone, right? There's a lot of things that just don't work very well uh, for the complexities of the systems that we want to create. Uh, and so with that, right, like we, we want to now extend, extend and expand what we're doing to be more dynamic and to be more inclusive of uh, the systems that we're creating, right? And so this is kind of the model that we want to move into. So with that, we'll move into auth n versus auth z. And this ends up being, uh, a question that comes up quite a bit when people are trying to adopt an authorization system because they think, I already have an SSO provider. I already know, uh, right, I already have something that identifies my users. But, right, this is the auth end side of the problem. And when we have, uh, but we need both sides of this coin, right? Not only do we need to identify the user, but we need to grant permissions in a way that is very modular, right? So you, you need to si solve both sides of this coin in order to have a true uh, authorization system, right? And so when we're on the auth end side, we, that is our SSO provider, that could be LDAP, that could be Active Directory, right? And then on the other side of that is when we're actually setting up uh, our authorization system, right? And this could be as simple as RBAC, right? Once again, that very coarse grain, just understanding what users belong to what groups and giving them, and, and giving them uh, permissions based on that. And then you have, right, you move into a little bit more complexity where you have like an ABAC system or attribute-based access controls where you start defining more attributes around each specific user and each interaction that they're doing. And it gives you a little bit more of that fine-grained nature or something like IAM, like directly in your cloud, where you can control right, individual components within, within the cloud. Right? And so it's giving you more and more uh, control over the interactions that need to happen. Right? And so when we think about this, right, we can think about um, Right, all the different places that, that these interactions are happening. Right? You can have things at the infrastructure layer, you know, uh, directly on Kubernetes or Docker, or uh, right, you can think of this as like inside Kubernetes, you have your admission controller. This is when Kubernetes is actually going to create resources. Right? We are admitting those resources into Kubernetes. Right? So we need to have 
that, that modularity to say, hey, I want uh, specific users or specific uh, service accounts or specific X to be able to create uh, some type of resource in this cluster. You want to be able to control what that looks like, right? Same thing with Terraform. You want to be able to say, when I run my Terraform plan, I know what is in scope and what is out of scope, right? I know that when users are creating resources, VMs, uh, maybe entire clusters, right? You want to know exactly how they should be created, not just saying, because you are an admin, you can create whatever you want, right? This ends up happening a lot in CICD pipelines where those permissions end up getting like the star value admin and those, those, those CICD pipelines end up being overpowered for what they need to do, right? And then on the, uh, on the application side of this, right, you can think of this as uh, when, when you are defining your applications, when you are building these services, what exactly are you going to allow your users uh, to actually do when they're interacting with the system, right? And so these are all different types of authorization decisions that need to happen, both on the infrastructure side and on the application side. And so what's needed, right? Like, and so this is kind of where we start getting into this policy as code mindset, right? Where now that we're looking for this dynamic fine grain authorization, Right, we start wanting to standardize this by using some sort of framework. Right? And by having a framework, now we know for all these different components from the infrastructure all the way up to the application, right, we can start defining what these policies look like in one language. Right? And we want to be able to say, well, how do we do this in one place? Right? How do we actually get these policies to apply to all of these different areas? And we do this by decoupling the policy logic from the tools that we're using. Right? And so this is where we start actually doing policy as code, because now that we have decoupled what authorization checks need to happen, now we can start defining these and putting them into our policy, or start checking these into Git as if, uh, like we will with the rest of our code base. Right? And so now we know a little bit uh, about policy as code, or sorry. Uh, sorry, one more, one more slide here. Uh, right, and so the evolution of policy, right? And so this is kind of where we started to how we got to policy as code. And so, right, once upon a time, right, like I remember my first job, my first uh, systems job where they gave me access to all the systems when I started, right? They created all my accounts, and it's basically just root access to everything, right? It was basically them saying, hey, when you're working with our systems, make sure you don't do this. And everything was written in a wiki, and who really reads the wiki every time they go to do something, right? Like, it's not something that you're going and manually checking to make sure you're doing the right thing every time, and so it's very error-prone. And then so, right, as things kind of moved along, we started saying, well, okay, well, now I can just kind of put some guardrails up and just kind of say, let the system block a few things here and there, right, and make sure the system stops you from doing anything that's, like, crucially bad. And then, right, and then this worked fairly well, but we ended up defining things like who is my admin group in a dozen different places, right? And so we had that, we had this hard-coded uh, policies that needed to be rewritten time and time again, right? And so this is where we've now moved into, right, like, okay, well then, how do we define this in one place and spread it out everywhere, right? Giving us this more of a policy as code mindset, right? And so when we're doing this, what we're doing is, we are extracting that policy, writing it in some sort of policy language, and then having a policy engine enforce this for that service, right? And so now we have uh, whatever that service is being able to call out to that policy engine, right? Maybe it's running directly on the service, maybe it's running next to the service, but that service now is able to make that call to say, hey, I don't know what to do uh, in this scenario, and you don't want it to know, right? You want your policy system to be able to make those decisions for it, right? So this ends up taking away complexity from the service and speeding up, uh, speeding up that check every time it needs to happen. Right, and so as we're doing this, right, what we're doing is we are applying the same principles that we use for software development for our policy, right? And so when we typically think about uh, the how we've come to build applications, we have this very standard idea of what the, the software development lifecycle is, and those same practices work for your policy development lifecycle, right? 
you want to be able to define things up front. You want to be able to uh, author and create things and check them into Git uh, before you're actually deploying them so that you can run your unit tests, your integration tests, right? You can verify everything that's happening before it goes into your systems because, right, like you don't want to check in a policy that's very restrictive and have it, you know, block access that you need or turn off access that's already there, causing things to happen that are unintended, right? And so you're able to use that same CACD pipeline to deploy policies that create the security guardrails, uh, but you're able to use this with the same tools and mindset that you're used to for when you're doing your software development, right? And then it gives you additional things like monitoring and logging, all the other additions to uh, uh, the lifecycle that you want to see. And so with that, right, we have this tool called Open Policy Agent, right? An Open Policy Agent has been around for quite a while. It is a graduated project in the CNCF. Uh, and right, it came about to solve this problem of how do we enable authorization across the, the tech stack, or across specifically your tech stack that you're using. Right? And it does this by creating that standardized policy framework that we talked about earlier. Right? And so OPA, uh, or OPA for Open Policy Agent, is a general purpose policy engine, right? That general purpose meaning that it's able to be used for all those tools and services, right? And so this tool, right, by, by decoupling, uh, actually, we'll, we'll get to that in the next slide, right, is going to allow you to really optimize your policy performance, uh, at your policy performance for the rest of your, your stack, right? And so how exactly does this work, right? And so as I mentioned, we are decoupling here. So the service at the top here is going to make, right, maybe this is going to be an HTTP call. Maybe this is going to be running as like a sidecar, right? But you're going to have these various options so that your service, right, can ask a question. And what is a question? A question is going to be uh, all of the input and data that your service has, and it's going to ship that as a JSON object to Open Policy Agent, right? And so we are calling this a question uh, but realistically, this is just understanding the data in and returning a data block back, right? And so at its simplest level, what you might be returning back is like a Boolean, like a true or false. But this could be much more complex than that as well, right? You might, be, you might want to send some sort of JWT token that you want to encrypt or decrypt. You might want to hash these values or create certificates on the fly, right? So OPA being this... Uh, being, being the decision engine, just understands how to take in this JSON, and then you're going to define with your policies what needs to be sent back, right? And so the magic happens inside of the policy itself because the policy is going to transform this data into what you need, right? And so, uh, right, like as I mentioned, right, there's a bunch, this is going to work with pretty much any of the tools in your tool stack because as a cloud native tool, everything basically speaks on the HTTP uh, protocol, so you're able to send uh, these requests, and then OPA will be able to compare the question coming in with the policies that are defined and any external data that you want to give it as well, right? That external data might be user data, it might be, um, right, just, just situational data, it could just be, right, like anything that's going to augment that policy to allow to allow uh, OPA to make the correct decision for what needs to happen. And so, right, like we typically are going to start at one place inside of your tech stack, but, right, these decisions, once again, happen throughout the entirety of your application. So you're going to insert where these policies happen at all of these different components, right? Uh, you're going to check when right, things are being created in your CICD pipeline. The policies are going to be applied there so that you know things are created in the right way. You're going to in include policies in between your services, right? Like, so if you're using some sort of service mesh or something that, that is giving you that telemetry between all of your services, you want to know that what's happening when those calls go from, one, from service A to service B, that everything is happening as you expect it to, right? And then down on the infrastructure layer, you want to make sure that things are always in the form and fashion that they should be, right? Understanding 
what the state of your system looks like and how, uh, yeah, and how it should look, right? And how you're going to want it to be, right? So you can see how very quickly all these different components are requiring some sort of policy that you're going to want to put in place. And so you also want to define what those look like uh, and be able to reuse them, right? You want to keep your policy infrastructure as simple as possible. And once again, we're doing this by decoupling where that policy enforcement happens, right? And we're handing it off to Open Policy Agent so that all the tools you see here on the screen can speak one language when they want to make this decision. Right, and here are some, some very common use cases and patterns. I've kind of touched on these uh, already, right? But right, Kubernetes with the admission controller is a very popular one. Uh, if you've seen, uh, if, you, if, you've, if you've been involved with the Open Policy Agent project, you've probably heard of Gatekeeper, and Gatekeeper is essentially a framework on top of Open Policy Agent, which turns your regular policies into CRDs so that you can apply them in the cluster, right? And then there's tools like Terraform, which uh, you can run either directly in like Terraform Cloud, where they have an Open Policy Agent uh, uh, run task, or you can do this on your own in your CI/CD pipeline by introducing OPA as like an action or uh, just a component within your CI/CD uh, uh, kind of process. And then with Envoy, right, we interact directly with Envoy through their APIs so that we can understand what's happening and make decisions uh, from service to service very quickly so we can implement those policies without introducing addi additional legacy or uh, uh, latency, right? Or, uh, right, Open Policy Agent is a very small Go binary, so you can actually run, uh, or you can create things that are very performant for your specific use cases, right? We have a, uh, we have a Go wrapper around Open Policy Agent, which is very performant. Uh, we've seen some very interesting deployments of this. One of the one very recent one that I saw was uh, Miro, basically understanding all the interactions on a Miro board and then shoving them uh, through a data pipeline to understand what the permissions are on the Miro board in real time, which is very impressive when you think about it because there may be dozens or you know, 100 users interacting with the board with 1,000 components. So the complexity there of who's allowed to mess with which components at which time ends up you know, scaling into the thousands of decisions a second very quickly. So you need to be able to create something that, or create a pipeline of authorization decisions that's very robust. Right, and so w when we're doing this, right, like this was the kind of, kind of, this was this was this was what I showed earlier, right? And we're basically just replacing uh, a policy engine with Open Policy Agent specifically, right? OPA is the tool that we want to use, and Rego is the uh, purpose-built uh, policy language that we want to write things in. And so now we're going to dig into uh, now we're going to dig into Open Policy or sorry Rego which is, as I mentioned, the purpose-built policy language, right? And so when I say purpose-built, what I mean is that it was created alongside Open Policy Agent to define what our policies look like, right? And so uh, there, were, there was large discussions in the beginning around what should a policy language look like? Should we just repurpose Python or JavaScript or Golang or just try to write things in a language that people already understand? The problem with that was that you're bringing in all of the baggage of that language that people want to write things in a specific way. And so trying to stick to a cloud-native uh, mindset is having a declarative language ended up feeling much more natural to solve this problem, right? And so now we have this declarative language where we want to define what our policy is going to do. Uh, and you're able to state this, state this in a clear fashion that now Open Policy Agent figures out what it needs to do. And so, since most, most people in this room haven't uh, written any Rego before, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna write a simple policy here, uh, which is just around uh, RBAC and controlling uh, or, or defining what, what a specific user can do, right? And so, here on the screen, uh, I'm showing some data in these uh, pink boxes at the bottom. I'm gonna abstract a lot of this away, but that's kind of just like the small data block that we're working with here. 
Uh, and so with that, right, on the left-hand side here, we have a package name, right? And this package name is a naming convention, right? The naming convention uh, we are, uh, is just a logical boundary between your policies, right? So this is a full-featured uh, coding language. And so we have this logical boundary in order to say, like, oh, I have a package of policies for uh, my AWS features. I have a package of policies for my Microsoft or Azure uh, uh, resources, right? So you just want to be able to have that uh, logical boundary so that you can call policies from one side and reuse them maybe between teams or just between policies, right? And then next up, we have these, this word called import. And so with import, what we're doing is we are protecting uh, backwards compatibility, right? And so this is very important when you're dealing with policies and you want to know that what you're doing is not going to break what already exists. Right, because breaking things that exist in a, uh, with a policy could have catastrophic effects. And so what we end up doing is as we advance the language, we wrap all of these, uh, all these features into this uh, future keywords import. And so uh, this ends up allowing us to read the policy in a much more, in a, in, in a language, or make it seem much more like English as you're reading the policies. And then so next up is, right, we have a declarative language. And declarative languages don't really like when things are undefined. And so you end up wanting to set a baseline for, for what uh, each of your rules is going to be uh, at the beginning, right? And so very typically, you're going to have like an allow uh, equals false as a default. And this kind of just says, right, fail close. Don't allow things to happen uh, that aren't intended. And then. Now that we have our defaults, uh, and we're starting to abstract more of the policy away at the top, but uh, it's all still there, right? So now, right, this very simple rule of like allow admins, what we're doing here is, right, we have one rule, which is that allow rule, but we are now calling out to a helper function. This helper function uh, is going to be what actually uh, runs the logic. And so in here, we can see uh, user is an admin if admin is in data.user roles, and we're checking for that specific input.user, right? And so that input user on the right-hand side there in the white box, right? This is going to be what is shipped from, what is shipped from uh, the service asking the question. So in this case, we're thinking about like an API request for a user trying to perform some sort of action uh, on a specific object uh, with that ID and the type dog, right? And so what we're doing now is we are basically looking up that user that we see is Alice in the box. And trying to and understand seeing what role Alice has assigned, and so in here we can see that Alice is an admin. So this rule would become true, right? And so, but what if Alice isn't an admin, right? And so now we end up having to be a little bit more granular around what this rule is going to do. And so this is right. So now we're breaking this down a little bit further, and we're actually checking for the specific grants that are tied to this user, right? And so remember. All of the information coming in is JSON. So we're able to navigate this JSON tree uh, just by doing this like dot notation, right? And so we can see in this allow if statement, right, uh, we, we are checking for a grant uh, in this user is granted uh, uh, kind of rules, or in this rule called user is granted, right? And so uh, at the second part of this rule, we can see that we are, we are uh, kind of going through, going through uh, the list of roles. And through, in that list of roles, we are checking for grants, right? And so what uh, we are looking for here in the input box, right, we can see Bob is trying to do an action called update on object uh, ID 456 with type cat, right? And so we are looking through, we are looking through this data set on the right-hand side, and we're seeing that it doesn't quite match up, right? Bob doesn't have this type cat assigned to him, right? So as we are cycling through, uh, the roles and grants that Bob has assigned to him, we are seeing that he doesn't quite have the permissions that he needs. And so as Rego is going through this list, right, and when these things don't match, these rules become, uh, right, defaults back to that uh, default equals allow equals false, right? And so with that, right, like that is just a very simple policy uh, that we've written, right? And so this is typically... Uh, what we end up telling people to do is like start really small. Find one very small uh, rule or around 
uh, what you want to define or protect with this policy and then expand from there. And so now that we have our first rule written, right, like with any good uh, coding practice, we're going to write our unit tests around the rule. So with, uh, with these unit tests, we, the, the language makes it very simple, right? And we normally recommend that you separate out your unit test uh, into a separate folder. So this one is just rback.tests, right? And you're going to define these tests uh, with this test underscore keyword at the front. And what I'm doing here is uh, supplying it with like a mock data, right? So before we had the input that was coming in in that JSON object, here we are just essentially saying, uh, imagine that this is the input and we're saying what we're expecting to happen, right? And we're expecting this allow to be true when the input, input shows Alice update and then type cat, right? And so uh, you, if you're doing any sort of good uh, test-driven development, right, you're going to have be able to define all of your unit tests up front to do this. And so uh, with the inverse of that, right, being able to see that this negative test not allow uh, is also going to, to right, not allow being true because uh, we're expecting it to be false. And so with that, uh, the very last section here is kind of just improving your rego, right? And so these are just common things that we see, uh, right? So on the left-hand side is as people are kind of learning the language, it ends up not being super clear, right? The left and right-hand side here both do the exact same thing, but you're going to see as you progress in your learning of the language, Right, you start using more of the features. You start using uh, annotations instead of just comments. You're now also like using rule names that make more sense. Right, it ends up being uh, very common that when you write your first rules, you write something that sounds uh, very easy to remember, but then maybe isn't super clear when you're looking at it and reviewing it. Right, so having a super user rule may not be the clearest thing when you're trying to review the audit logs. Right, but using rule names like allow lets you know that, oh, okay, so this rule was trying to uh, allow something to happen, right? And so the second thing here is reusing expensive computations, right? And so on the left-hand side here, or in the red box, right, we're going to see that in both of them, we're doing the same check instead of using a helper function, right? This helper function is what's actually going to uh, uh, when you're scaling out and you're doing things uh, at, a, at a much bigger scale, you're going to want to be able to use these helper functions to reduce the number of iterations and calls uh, that you're making. Right? And so these ex reusing expensive computations isn't just for iteration, but also when you're making like HTTP calls or using external data to pull that information in. And then my last one here is just nested iteration. Right, and this is something that also very common when you write your first rules is it ends up being uh, very simple to just loop through your loops when you're checking for things. But right, then you end up with these coding problems where uh, uh, things take much longer than you expected. And you end up trying to solve performance problems uh, later down the line instead of defining, uh, defining a, a list that you are a set that you can reach out to. Right? And so making, making information reusable is a big part of uh, writing code that uh, is very performance. And so with that, I just want to say thanks. This is a quick primer on OPA and Rego. And uh, yeah, thanks for attending. <laughs> cool. cool. And I think we have one minute uh, if there's any, any questions. Yes? Cool. All right. So the question was, how would you measure uh, performance, right? If, as you are introducing these policies, right, how do you, how do you see what's happening? And so there are two things there, right? One is on the uh, on the OPA side of things. As you are defining them, you can uh, run uh, what we we have a 
policy benchmarking performance tool uh, built into the, the CLI, so you can actually see like how much time down to like the nanosecond that each policy takes to run, and this is where you can very easily see spikes when you have like nested iteration. These become very apparent that certain rules take much longer than expected. Uh, and then on the other side of that is uh, what you wanting to kind of measure just end-to-end -end latency to see if anything has changed with these policies or kind of two, uh, two places that you could look when you are trying to measure uh, what the performance impact is like. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by export? Got it. Yes, and so uh, with dashboarding, yeah, you can you can you can set it up to export information, right? Like uh, OPA has management APIs that you can pull all this information out of. Okay, and I, with that, I think I'm actually at time. So thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.